everyone. Um, welcome to another panel, uh, which is part of uh, the Bristol, the yeah, Bristol, Britain and Beyond Festival, uh, a festival running throughout this week, featuring uh, talks and discussions from a number of leading journalists, academics and thinkers about the issues we face today, organised by Epigram, the University of Bristol student newspaper. Uh, my name is Sivash, I'm the paper's deputy digital editor, and I'm very, very excited to be uh, chairing this panel tonight on English identity and what that means for us who are living in England. Um, I think it's a very important issue to discuss, particularly now, given how national identities sort of come into the spotlight a lot more with Brexit and also what may be the breakup of the United Kingdom itself. A recent Sunday Times poll found that the majority of uh, people in the UK think that Scotland will become independent in the next decade and that Northern Ireland will leave the UK to form part of the United Ireland in that time frame as well. So this all raises a lot of quite pressing questions about, well, what about England and what happens to England in this context? Um, but it's not just political and sort of um, constitutional issues that it raises. It also just identifies the fact that the idea, the concept of an English nation is quite a contested one. It's quite, um, it's not very clearly defined when you compare it to something like French, um, which has sort of three very clear words that sum it up. This isn't quite as clear and it's quite mixed up with Britishness. So I think it's a really important topic to discuss all, the, all of the time, but especially right now. And that's why I'm very, very excited to have um, this panel joining me to discuss that. So the panel uh, tonight's event uh, will feature Professor John Denham. John is a professorial fellow at the University of Southampton Centre for English Identity and Politics. And he's also a founding member of the English Labour Network. Previously, John was also a uh, member of parliament for the Southampton Itchen constituency. And whilst in parliament, he served as the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee and a secretary of state for communities and local government amongst many, many other roles. Joining John tonight is Bristol's own Professor Tariq Madud. Tariq is professor of uh, sociology, politics and public policy, and is also the founding director of the, set, the university center for the study of ethnicity and citizenship. Um, in 2001, Tariq was awarded an MBE for his services to social science and ethnic relations. And last but not least on tonight's panel is Dr. Alex Niven. Alex is a lecturer in English at the University of Newcastle. He's also a founding editor of Repeated Books, and he himself has written a number of books, including New Model Island, How to Build, a radical culture beyond the idea of England. Most importantly of all, Alex is not only a former Bristol graduate, but a former epigram writer. So we're very happy to welcome him back to the fold. And if you think his writing is exceptional, you know where it started, it was with us. Um, welcome to you all. We're very happy to have you joining us tonight. And um, just one thing to say before we get started, I think a number of us have had slight connection issues throughout the day. So if we do, if any of us cut out, please do bear with us. That's how things are working uh, nowadays. We are also recording the event. So if you cut out and miss anything we've said, we will be uploading the recording for you to watch back. Uh, so with that disclaimer, I'd like to get stuck in. We've got a lot to get through. And I thought just to get us started, um, if I could ask each of you, what Englishness means to you or what you think it means if you think it exists in any meaningful sense at all. I know it's quite, um, it's quite blurred with Britishness. So I think just getting a definition to get us started would be a good way of uh, going. So uh, Tariq, could I start with you? Yes, well, you know, I don't know whether really I should be on this panel. Unlike John and Alex, I mean, I really don't have the kind of expertise that they have, both in relation to the study of English national identity, but in John, John's case, I mean, uh, real deep uh, practical and activist concern 
my own starting point, I would say, rather than a definition, is that I'm someone who thinks of themselves as British and proud to be British, and I had to struggle to be British, to be accepted as British, and it's not a struggle that's over. And I also do think of myself as English, but to use a, uh, a response category that John uses in one of his surveys or several of his surveys, I think of myself as more British than English. I want my Englishness to be folded in to my Britishness, not to challenge it or tear it, but above all, I want an Englishness that is capable of being multiculturalized, that embraces multiculturalism in the way that British national identity has started to do and I think is continuing to do. Thank you for that. And I think that question of ethnicity is definitely is one that interests me a lot. And it's one that we'll get into just uh, in a moment. Uh, but now, uh, John, could I move on to you? Uh, what would you sort of have to maybe not define, but sort of what's your starting point, as uh, Tariq said, for Englishness? Let, let, let's pick let's pick out a few facts. So in the polling, four out of five people who live in England describe themselves as strongly English and three out of five are proud to be English. So it's not a minority or an obscure or strange identity. <laughs> However, as has already been said, most people combine their sense of English identity with their British identity. And we'll probably come back to how those combinations work in future. I won't dwell on that now, but let's, if we can, let's focus on the English side. And any national identity, doesn't matter where it is, is a set of stories, narratives, ideas, symbols that people share sufficiently to give them a sense of what academics call an imagined community, the nation they belong to. One of our problems in talking about Englishness is that sociologists haven't bothered to talk to people about why they feel English for about 20 years now. And national identities change over time. So 50 years ago, for example, English would have been universally seen as a white identity. Only a minority of people now see English as a white identity. So these changes are taking place. But from what we do know, we can probably say Englishness would be associated with identifying with the geographical nation of England. Uh, which is more or less unchanged for a thousand years. It's usually associated with a sense of rootedness within England. So you may be English, but being from Yorkshire or Devon may well be a very important part of your identity. It's quite a collective rather than a liberal individualistic identity. So your sense of belonging to your community, your sense of solidarity with others tends to be heightened. You may have stories of struggle, certainly of standing up for each other, of knowing your rights, but you're probably also fairly patriotic and in some sense is very happy to see the monarchy as representing some symbol of the nation. And I could go on like that. And there are other strands of this, which obviously associated with pride in the language, with landscape and, and literature. But for the key thing is to understand that for most people in England, being English is something important and tangible that means something to them, but it is in a process of changing just as Britishness is. Thank you for that. Um, and finally, Alex, uh, what about you? Well, um, I guess I'm a, a a, a skeptic when it comes to uh, Englishness and uh, being prescriptive about what Englishness is. Um, I, th I, I think it's very difficult to identify many characteristics of Englishness that are um, clearly distinct from both the other countries in the in the United Kingdom, as 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 we've said up, up to now. We have this kind of almost terminal problem of. Um, the fact that England and, and Britain have, have not been separate for hundreds of years, so it's very difficult to talk about um, a, a separate identity for England in the context of the United Kingdom um, and and other indeed other countries th through the world. You know, we could obviously have a much uh, more kind of wide ranging debate about essential uh, ab about the uh, you know the the pros and cons of nationhood. Full stop. 
throughout the world. But it but it seems to me that it's very difficult. Um, I mean, I, I think lots of the characteristics that John identified, I would agree with, but I'm not so sure that they're clearly distinct from, uh, you know, for starters, other countries in the United Kingdom, but also other countries in in Europe and further afield. So I think when it comes to Englishness, I'm 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 quite skeptical that there is such a thing. Um, partly because we haven't had the material reality of uh, an English nation state as distinct from other countries for several hundred years. So it seems to me to be, you know, asking a bit much that we'd actually have uh, a coherent national identity when we haven't had an English nation state for, for so long. Um, and I think that sort of leads us nicely onto uh, something that uh, John touched on as well, which is, well, I think all three of you touched on, which is this interaction and overlap between Englishness and Britishness. Obviously, in a practical sense, everything that is within England and that is English is also British because England is within the United Kingdom. Um, but I, I'd say maybe sort of culturally, maybe in terms of sort of people's personal identifications with things, um, do you think how much of a difference do you think there is between those two terms and sort of what would you say is if if they can be disentangled what things would be British and what things would be English and just to before I sort of uh, let you all answer um just to add to that data that John was talking about I think that may have been from a YouGov survey in 2018 which essentially found that 80 percent of people surveyed identify as English and 82 as British so pretty much most of the population identifies both and the numbers are pretty similar. Um, but John, uh, what would you say is sort of, how would you distinguish Englishness from Britishness if that can be done? Well, if I took a, a snapshot of where we are at the moment, we need to understand the history, uh, which Alex has just touched on. Um, there were, England was for a long time at the heart of a union, which was at the heart of an empire right up until the Second World War. After the Second World War, we had for a period of time a very strong unitary British state, basically the one that had fought the Second World War. But from the 1960s onwards, that has been fragmented as Welsh identity, Scottish identity and difference uh, developed. And as the unresolved problems of Northern Ireland broke out again in conflict and, 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 and violence. England, in that process has therefore been work or parts of England have been working towards identifying who they are if the union is actually going in different directions. So this is a process, not a status of affairs. So what you find with Englishness and Britishness is that for quite a lot of people, probably most people still, to be English is to belong to what I described as the geographical nation of England with its sense of community and so on. And to be British speaks to that wider construct of the union. So you can happily be both. And most people see no conflict. However, you also have in England people who are British, not English. And they're very curious because they tend not really to care about the union very much either. It's almost like a citizenship identity and Tarek can tell us much more about where this came from the idea of a British citizenship and legal equality and then you have a part of the population which is very clearly more English than British and they tend to have much more of a focus on England so if you look at it purely in political terms they're the ones who would like an English parliament they're the ones who think that England's interests are not the same as the union they are as one survey described them, skeptical about both both uh, England's unions. They didn't like the EU and they're not very keen on the Barnet formula and Scottish devolution either. So you do, if you want a, a neat picture, there isn't one because people combine these different identities in different ways. The important thing is to say they are real to the people who feel them and it causes people to see the world in different ways. Um, I guess, um, Tariq, you yourself yeah. said that you see yourself as both British and English. Um, yeah. Are there any aspects that you would say, are sort of, are there any, can you, can you say which 
things, if any, you would say exclusively British or exclusively English about how you identify? Or again, as John said, are they pretty much sort of more entangled? Uh, I mean, I, I think we, we all would have to agree, anyone would agree that they are more than entangled, they are blended. So you said, uh, Sivash, a few minutes ago that, well, everything English is British because England is part of Britain in a geographical way. Well, I would say that actually, if you think of it historically, so the, the union was, you know, uh, formed in 1701. So England and Scotland had their own histories up to, up to that point. And if we think of so many things that we think are British, well, they're English, starting with the English language, Magna Carta, Parliament, monarchy, Shakespeare, and of course, the things that we should be ashamed of that are also a stain on our history. Slavery, that started with the English, not with the British. Though of course, it continued with, uh, uh, with the British and there was the British Empire, uh, which of course was a Anglo-Scottish Empire. But so many things I, I feel that are part of England have become part of Britain and they can't really be separated. Though I must say that when I cycle in the Cotswolds, that landscape, those gentle rolling hills, so much greenery, yeah, I feel that's England. I also, I also cycle, I also cycle in Monmouthshire, and that's not so different. But there is a, a slight more ruggedness with the peaks there, and so on. So that's a, that's just a, a sense of place, and I'm attached to both of both both those places. And my wife is Welsh, um, and I, I think the the Britishness that we have, that you know, historically has been shaped, is so blended of the different parts of uh, uh, the Union, including, of course, you know, the Irish. Um, and now, you know, for the last couple of generation, uh, people like myself, people like my father coming here and so on, and from the West Indies and Africa and so on. So I like that mix. I think there is a, a real national identity through that mix. It's not a, it's not a cosmopolitan nowhere, it's actually got a very strong sense of history and place. But it is true that as British identity developed, the what we might call, you know, the ruling class, the elite, thought that English identity should be checked so as not to disrupt the cooperative character of the elites within, within Britain. Especially, especially the Scots, and they did that. And then later generations of not necessarily political elites, but certainly intellectual and cultural elites kind of took that one step further and said, well, actually, there is no special distinctive English identity. It's either just British or in the contemporary cosmopolitan interpretation, it's not even distinctively British. It's just like, part of anywhere else. And I think those are all wrong. So I don't share that interpretation of national identity, which um, sees it as completely um, a, a fiction and non-distinctive. I mean, even France, that's so close to us in so many different ways, we see it's a, diff it's a different country. You mentioned France can be defined by three words. Presumably, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Well, right, yeah. liberté or liberty is one of the defining words of English political history as well. Equality, well, things like uh, equality under the law and so on. And people, you know, for instance, tried by their peers and then later developed in other ways like the franchise and social equality and so on. But those, those are English ideas as well. But the English take on them and the French take on them are very different. So I, I think there are genuine national identities and that there is a English uh, cultural identification and John referred to it. And I entirely agree with him. He said, 
pe people feel it and it's real. And if they feel it, it is real. And that's exactly how ethnic identities work as well. So that this is not peculiar to England or peculiar to national identity. Um, so I, I, do, I do feel uh, English. I mean, Bristol is an English city, though it's also actually uh, a very, in some senses, a very cosmopolitan city and certainly lots of Welsh people here. Um, um, yeah, and I lived before in Oxford and London, and these, these are English cities. I, I don't think of them as, as Welsh or Scottish, or for that matter, French or German. So, yeah, there, there are genuine uh, sensibilities and identities. I think, I think they're, real, they're real, but for me, uh, it's very much a blended British identity, which I have been arguing to be truly inclusive must now be a multicultural and multi-religious identity as well. And um, I think following on from that, so you've written about British identity as sort of by this point being a, and sort of ideas of British nationhood being sort of a multicultural nation and even sort of British nationalism being multicultural nationalism. Um, and then when we sort of look at the data, even though amongst sort of, the public at large, identities of Englishness and Britishness are sort of equal. When we break that down by ethnicity, and admittedly the data I've got is just white and ethnic minority, it doesn't get into specifics, we see that amongst white respondents, 85% identified as English, 84% of them identified as British, so broadly similar. But when we look at um, sort of BAME populations, 73% of them identified as British, that that drops to 45% identifying as English. Um, and this is sort of just an unfounded idea that I've had, but do you think there's any, um, would it be sort of because Britishness is sort of, it's a citizenship and it's, you can sort of prove quite concretely that you are British or that you have become British. You have a passport, you have documentation, Englishness is more of a cultural identity in the sense that you can't, if someone says you're not English, how would you sort of show that to them? How would you become English? It can definitely happen, but I suppose it's less sort of, it's less simple to feel like you can prove either to yourself or to others that you are English. Um, if you're not sort of, if you, if you're not white, essentially. Do you think this disparity between um, ethnicities is that because um, sort of ethnic minorities don't feel comfortable identifying as English or they're choosing not to for any number of reasons I think I think there's something worth looking at that and Tarek will have a comment on this what we call British multiculturalism largely only happened in England mm. that in Scotland really from the time when devolution and independence movements began in the 60s and early 70s, Scottish political elites had to confront the question of who was going to be Scottish. Was it just somebody who had a family entitlement to wear the tartan, or was it everybody who lived in Scotland? And of course they had to say Scottishness is going to be there for everybody who lives in Scotland. In England, Britishness, which was the citizenship, became the focus both of, if you like, top-down state-sanctioned multiculturalism, but hugely important bottom-up grassroots demands of which Tarek was a leader, to be allowed to be British. There was never that engagement with shaping English identity, either from the grassroots up or the top-down. Now, I actually think the remarkable thing is not how little Englishness has changed, but how much it has changed. And I gave you the data earlier on the, the small minority of people who now think that English is a white identity. However, there has never been a serious attempt to promote Englishness as a, as a right, as an identity of right to ethnic minorities. And in truth, we've, been, we've left it far too much to sport to do all the heavy lifting. Now, if you take somebody like Marcus Rashford, a generation and a half ago, black English footballers weren't regarded as English footballers by a significant minority of English football fans. 
now an unquestionably English footballer, is accepted as a small p political spokesman on behalf of families black and white right across the country. That's the change that's taking place. But I, I think we are in a position where an inclusive Englishness is within grasp but we've got to stop just letting it drift. And there are too many people, honestly, on the liberal left who tend to say, no, I insist that Englishness is an ethnic identity. There are almost people pushing it into a box that it's been trying to get out of. But I've been arguing for years that we need to have the same engagement with English identity that multiculturalism gave British identity, and actually to a very considerable degree, not for everybody who's British, but at least has for many people created a Britishness that is genuinely inclusive. And Englishness could go the same way, but it, it needs a push, a shove, a helping hand. Yeah, uh, Tariq, would you agree with that, that Englishness is becoming multicultural, it's just not there yet in the way that Britishness is? Oh, sorry, I think you're on mute. I muted myself just because I got family around me. Uh, um, I, I think there is a, a genuine kind of ferment and if you like contest taking place because there is a kind of core ethno-nationalism that identifies itself with England. We, we've seen this in relation to Brexit and post-Brexit, in fact, as well. And, and in fact, you know, the election of, of, of Johnson's government even. So, I, I, but I agree, I agree with um, when John says it needs, it needs a shove or a helping hand, whatever his phrase was, oh. I, I, I'd say, yeah. And, and I'm in for that. So I'm not backing away from that. Like, oh, well, I'm not interested in being English or anything like that, not at all. And actually, the statistic that you gave, the discrepancy between white people identifying with English and ethnic minorities in England identifying with English, I mean, you didn't have an age breakdown, but I, I think that's really significant. So people of my generation, I agree, we've been battling to be British. So, you know, that's kind of our kind of psychological thing. We hold on to that. Uh, I think the younger generation don't see it like that. They've been brought up in uh, schools and neighborhoods and football fields and TV programs and so on, where just like anybody else in, in their peer group, they, they're told they're English, they want to be English and they stand up for being English and cheering England on the football field or rugby field or whatever it is. So I think, um, I think, Englishness is growing and its growth means the possibility of um, having a view of England that's not uh, overly ethnic. So as John says, even most English people will agree that you don't have to be white to be English. But there is, there is more of a, a race and ethnic uh, identifying core, uh, defining core with, with with English identity. And I think that uh, I don't feel at all defeatist about it. I, because there was a time, you know, when in the 70s and 80s, lots of people, anti racist included, not just the far right, thought that if you were ethnic minority, you weren't really British, you were something else, kind of half of this was half something else, but you were kind of. Yes, you know, we, we'll champion your rights and so on, but we don't really think of you as British, you're entitled to some alternative identity. And for a lot of people that was like black or something similar. So I think, uh, I think minorities certainly don't want to be excluded from an English identity. And one of the reasons that when you said do ethnic minorities feel uncomfortable with English identity? Well, yes, but only because we feel we won't be accepted if we make the claim, if we say, in a, a certain group or join join a certain activity that well we're we're English people might say well you're not or you know only politely entertain that idea so I think that's the discomfort the feeling well we're not sure whether we belong to that club or we are allowed to be members of that club yeah um, and Alex um, I'd love to hear what you think about this as well. <laughs> 
Well, I, I'm, I'm. It's interesting the the, the question of age, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that maps onto uh, this question of age maps onto the question of um, ethnic minorities and 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 uh, BAME community, BAME communities identifying with Englishness. My understanding is that uh, you know even in the if even going by the survey data that exists, and I think there are kind of problems with basing all of this on on polling, which seems to me to have inherent contradictions e even in the polling. Um, but it, uh, my understanding is that age-wise, there's much less identification with Englishness uh, the younger the demographic. I mean, I my identification with Englishness uh, as a, a person in their mid thirties is is very very tenuous. Um, I, I, I guess I'd be interested uh, to hear from, you know, from other people and perhaps, at, you know, at the end of our session to see what other people have to say. Um, but, I, you know, I, 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 I guess I don't share this view that Englishness is, I think Englishness might have to kind of cross over into immediacy um, if we have a situation whereby uh, the union crumbles and, uh, you know, England is forced into a kind of autonomous reality. Uh, but I, I, I guess I don't share this sense that Englishness is on the rise um, amongst, my, you know, amongst people I know and perhaps, you know, younger generations too. But I'd be interested to hear what other people have to say about that. Yeah, and on that note, if anyone does have any comments and questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll try and bring them up towards the end. Um, so as we've seen, sort of one area that Englishness is changing or evolving is with regards to ethnic um, identity and it's sort of expanding in that regard. But somewhere else, I think, where it's sort of challenged is regional identities. So I think there's certainly between London and the rest of the country, but also um, there's a very just large economic and cultural divide, which raises the question of can Englishness and can England or Englishness encompass all of that? But also I think regional identities in themselves are very powerful. So um, Alex, I'll quote a, a line just from New Model Island, where you said, uh, when you were living in London, as Northerners in the capital, we'd always felt like strangers in a strange land. And that's not, I've heard that from all number of people who've sort of moved about England, where there's both a very big cultural shock, but also regional identities are very, very strong. So I guess my question to you would be, is English identity sort of made redundant when we've got local and regional um, identities that we can sort of articulate quite clearly and which do motivate us to take action politically and culturally? Is there a, can Englishness compete with that? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm again, sc skeptical that it can, and, and I uh, am an advocate of, of um, forms of regional devolution or a form of federalism, or there are various different ways of imagining, reimagining uh, England and the British Isles, so that kind of uh, you have an arrangement whereby regions have some kind of analogous uh, form of devolution to the sorts of devolution that you get in Scotland and Wales. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think most often historically, we have had a centre margins dynamic in the British Isles, as in the British Empire, which, you know, began with a very centralised British state and a very centralised English core to that British state, which has kind of relegated in a sense regional identities to the periphery uh, even within England we obviously have that kind of sense of periphery relationship in the empire as a whole um, but you know that it, it there's a, a similar dynamic or analogous in some ways in, in some ways not uh, within it within England so that you have um, very kind of um, very uh, profound differences between different parts of England uh, you know, and, and I think one thing that should be stressed is the, the the vast kind of population of England. It's actually, you know, people talk about this being a small island. It's not actually that that small. You know, the, the, the you know Great Britain isn't isn't that small. Uh, and population wise, uh, you know, England itself has a huge huge population, uh, which you know, England alone would be in the top, I think, twenty five countries in the world population wise. Uh, 
Um, so I think the the idea, you know, it becomes difficult in that in in those circumstances um, to talk about a unified national identity for you know 56 million people. Um, I think you know there's an argument there for saying that a better way of dividing up England itself is to think about you know uh, different different regional units of populations ranging between you know three four million up to about ten million. Um, there's a kind of rational basis for that and a kind of deeper cultural basis for that. And, and you know, you cited the example of the kind of the North-South divide. Uh, there are many others, you know, the Southwest is a, is a complicated case, uh, as I know from, from my time as a student in, in Bristol. Um, so certainly I, I think regionalism is something that complicates the idea of a unified England and a unified English identity. Um, and I think sort of, if you want, want to respond to that, um, either Tariq or John. Um, could I, can, can I if just, we were to have a... Uh, okay. Yeah, I just yeah, want to come back, it. and I think that, that there's a mistake to do two things. One is to pose the idea of doing something at an England level as an identity question. The reality is, certainly I'll accept, not enough people in England prioritise their English identity to say that English identity is the basis for changing the governance of England. I would say the argument has to be as much civic and democratic as anything else. And I would simply say, I do not understand why a nation like England does not elect MPs who make its own laws, because we don't. Our laws are made by the Union Parliament. There's no government of England, and nor is there anybody accountable to England. So there's a civic and democratic case for doing England differently. The second mistake is to pose that against taking into account people's identity. Now, I am a huge skeptic about dividing England into regions because there's only a tiny number of regions that people identify with. And the idea that you could have seven or nine legislatures in England, as crowded a nation as England, is, I think, a nonsense. But as Alex has said, England is far too centralised. So far more of the administration and the executive action in England needs to be sent decentralised. Now, in some cases, I think that would be to an identifiable region. But in other cases, it would be to city regions like Greater Manchester or to county councils or whatever. So we need, we need a way of governing England, which is democratic at the national level, but is also very mindful of these different identities. We've just got to not do what I'm afraid my own government did, which is try and design regions from Whitehall, which means you end up telling Bournemouth that it's in the same region as the Forest of Dean, north of where you are, and Truro, when they simply are not. It's just that some Whitehall civil servant clearly sort of designed, still in Whitehall from the age of empire, who was used to drawing straight lines on maps, decided you could divide England into regions. You have to do devolution on the basis of where people actually think they live and identify with. Um, and I think this leads us nicely into- Yeah, um, could I, oh, could I just, yes, yes, yeah, yes, I, I know you'd like to bring other people in, which is, I do too, but I just add one thing, because I do very largely agree with what John has just said, but I just pick on one word that Alex used. He's rational. He said it would be more rational to divide England up into smaller units. Well, I suppose I'm non-rational, at least in this respect. We shouldn't do what is rational. We should do what people think is right. Um, and we shouldn't, I mean, if we looked at uh, Scotland and Wales, if we looked at the uh, devolution result in Wales, for instance, it would have been actually very appropriate to divide Wales up into two. North and South Wales voted very differently. If we look at Scotland, something similar would follow as well. I remember a few years after devolution began, I was, I was up in Scotland and someone from Inverness said, oh, we in Inverness, we don't want to be ruled by those southerners. And I mean Edinburgh is what he said. So the idea that Wales and Scotland, oh, they can't be divided because they're nations. But England, well, what's the rational solution for England? As if it's just, you know, something that can be divided up by what other people think rather than what English people think about themselves 
I think that's not a, a good way to do politics. That's the wrong kind of rationality for politics. Um, I guess, Alex, if you want to come back to that quickly, feel free. Um, but also, I yeah. think something I'd sort of, yeah, go for it. Well, I guess, that, you know, um, I was I wasn't saying that I, I was saying that, you know, Russia, that's that's one way of looking at it. If we're talking about population, um, you know, it, it, there's a sense of rationality playing a part in how uh, clearly, you know, rationality, the country has if we're talking about devolution, there is a rational element to how that takes place. It isn't completely a kind of, uh, you know, let's let, you know, put people in a kind of room and let their emotions run riot. Um, I mean, I, I, I would say though that you know that there's difficulty. People want different things at different times. Uh, if we look at the case of Scotland and Wales and Scottish and Welsh uh, nationalism, um, if uh, you know, if we'd said kind of 50 or 60 years ago, um, you know, what what do you think should happen? That would have obviously there, there was much less support in, for example, in Scotland for independence. It's still, uh, you know, kind of borderline. Um, so these things kind of shift over time. I think, you know, if we're talking about um, what we're going to do in the future, in the long term, um, I don't see why thinking about regional identities should not be kind of acknowledged as something that might, might grow, uh, can be fostered, uh, can feature as part of a debate about what can happen in the future, um, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, it depends when, when are we going to have the kind of big referendum or, you know, when are we going to have this kind of big moment where we allow people, I mean, because that's what we're really talking about ultimately, isn't it? You know, when uh, are we going to have a redivision of our polity? Um, and at what point then do we tap into people's emotions and how do we tap into people's emotions um, you know, not, and I don't think anybody yet has the answer to how that's going to happen. It it might happen as a kind of knee-jerk response or a kind of um, inevitable uh, consequence of Scottish devolution if that happens, or that might not happen. Uh, so, you know, the Scots might not be allowed independence. Um, so yeah, it's it. Uh, you know, I agree. Emotion is is very important, but you know, how is that emotion going to be? expressed politically how is it you know is it going to be part of a referendum which as we know in the case of brexit isn't necessarily doesn't always necessarily work out according to plan um can i, so, can yeah. I just say alex i think it's a really important point though because england is the only part of the union that has not had a debate or a referendum about how it wishes to be governed in the last 20 years so Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have had at least one in some cases too. And part of the problem with this discussion is, you made this point earlier, we are dependent on really polling evidence, which asks people to choose various options without any discussion. And I find it extraordinary at a time when we now know about citizens assemblies and deliberative participation and all those different ways of finding out what people want, that there has been no attempt to go out to people across England, the, the, the more English, the more British, the people who have both of them, and actually say, where do you want power to lie? What, what would democracy feel like for you? And I, I think that that is absolutely, absolutely a priority now. And if we end up only dealing with it because Scotland has voted to leave, we'll have the same sort of trauma that we're now having because of all of the consequences of Brexit, which are being worked through instead of being considered properly in the first place. So I finished. Um. Yeah, um, I'm afraid we're almost um, out of time, but I think as we've all been sort of hearing, this is quite a live issue and it's one that is not going to go away and it needs sort of a lot more discussion, a lot more attention and probably some things to change. Although I guess we're all sort of maybe on slightly different pages about what needs to happen. Um, thank you all for that discussion. Uh, we've got a few questions, but I'm aware that we're running quite long time. So if you could please keep the answer um, quite short. We've had a question about 
um, in light of the pandemic, we've seen some sort of vaccine nationalism and sort of the idea that a lot of this, um, the sort of liberal idea of sort of being more open has in some instances closed itself off a lot more and we're sort of, I guess, when push comes to shove, more interested in looking after ourselves. Um, so the question is, has the pandemic forced us to reconsider nationalism in any sense? And I, I suppose, feel free, who, anyone who wants to take this. Well, it's certainly exposed to nationalism. I, I don't think we should equate this with English nationalism, though, because Boris Johnson, who's probably the biggest exponent of, of COVID nationalism, uh, is a British nationalist. He's not an English nationalist. It's the union he goes on about. It's Britain he goes on about. And I think it has thrown up a challenge more broadly about, and, and in a sense, Brexit does this. It raises all sorts of questions about how we see ourselves in relation to the rest of the the rest of the world. Um, but I don't think there's a particularly English feature uh, to, that, to that discussion. Part of England's problem is that its political elites are almost all British nationalists rather than people engaged with England per se, and that would be true of the Labour Party as it is of the Conservative Party. Um. I suppose, unless anyone else would like to uh, respond to that, I think that is, we are at time. I think we've run over just by two minutes. So apologies for keeping you just that little bit longer. Um, on behalf of everyone watching, I just want to thank uh, all three of you for what's been, I think, a really enlightening discussion. I think it's been really, really important, even though I think there hasn't always been agreement, but just, I think there has been agreement on the fact that the sort of question of England isn't currently solved and that something, it's not sort of working as it is. Now the question of what we do and when and for what reasons are very live, but hopefully everyone watching is sort of, if they weren't already has been motivated to think of these questions as really quite important ones for the future of sort of our political uh, futures. Um, so all that's left for me uh, tonight to say is a very, very big thank you to Alex, to John and to Tariq for joining us. Um, hopefully everyone managed to, I know I had some connection issues, but I think that was more on my end than on anyone else's. But if not, we will be sharing the recording as well. So hopefully you can catch up with anything you might have missed um, then. So once again, just a, another very big thank you to all three of you for joining us this evening. I think it's been really, really wonderful to hear from all three of you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And for anyone who's watching, please don't miss the next two events we've got coming up for this festival tomorrow. At 6 p.m., we're joined by Martin Booth, editor of Bristol 24 7, who will be talking about Bristol outside of the student bubble and the rest of the city. And then at 7 p.m., we have Hamish Birrell, who is the Economist's public policy correspondent, talking about how to make sense of Britain and its politics. So, very relevant for this. Thank you everyone and have a nice evening.